Emma Watkinson with us this morning. Um, Emma's going to tell us about the pathway to where she got to, but I thought it'd be really helpful to start with her experience of school, uh, the subjects she took at A-level, the things you enjoyed, um, and what you did at university. Would that be an OK starting point, Emma? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, my name's Emma. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Silk Fred. And for those of you guys who don't know what Silk Fred is, it's an online um, fashion retailer for women. Um, we work with um, independent and startup um, fashion brands, and we have um, a million customers, um, just over a million followers on Instagram, 100 people um, who work not out of our office at the moment, um, but from home. And uh, yeah, pretty fast, fast growth business. I think our last year's turnover was just over 60 million. So bit of a bit of a big journey um, in the last in the last couple of years. Um, my experience with um, sixth form and A levels. So when when I was choosing um, my A levels, I got some really good advice, and that was to not just do the subjects that were going to be important for university applications, but the ones that I really enjoyed the most because a levels and particularly like when i did them which feels like forever ago now um but when i did them you know i they, they were, you know they, they were quite intense and you have to spend a lot of time like studying and thinking about it so someone said to me you know do something that you really enjoy doing rather than just picking it because you think it'll be good on an application and then the results should follow through um and you know if you enjoy doing it then hopefully works well for you and um, the a levels i took um i did English language, English literature, um, history, and drama uh, for AS level, and then I dropped drama at A level, um, which I actually bitterly regret. Um, I really love that subject, but um, my teachers, I was applying for um, Oxbridge at the time, and um, they really, you know, they really, really wanted me to focus and zone in on um, English language, literature and history, which were all subjects that I really loved. So I was very humanities um, focused and my degree that I went on to do was English, which I loved because if you like reading and you love literature, it's basically book club. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's if you're really interested in it, you know, it's a fantastic degree. I, I really enjoyed it and I also liked that it allowed me to bring on like lots of skills that I use today but left it was very open-ended and left me with a lot of choices um, for my future now when we're talking about when I'm standing up in front of investors uh, trying to raise money and I have to talk about who we are why we're different um, why we're better than the competition I think about all the things in English that I did were about shaping a message and communicating effectively. Um, so all of these, and even going back to drama, like that I did at AS level, you know, standing up in front of, you know, rooms full of people. Um, I've spoken at I've spoken at conferences with audiences of over two thousand, which is very nerve wracking. But you know, having ha having done drama at AS level, you know, get, helped me build confidence to be able to do that. So even though I didn't. Um, use my degree let's call it in a strictly like vocational way there are so many things that I got out of my A-levels and my degree that that I, that I that I still use today. Um, lots of our students tend to be quite worried about taking um, sort of broad subjects so I often get students saying to me well what will I do with a history degree? Um, what other <laughs> skills do you think you gained from your degree? Because obviously I think sometimes our students are a bit worried about taking something so broad. Yeah, and I think I think that's definitely um, a valid concern. And I think ultimately, like, you know, having having been sort of out in the world now for, how old am I now? 15 years or so. And also, you know, we've built a team at Silk Fred, um, mostly young. Um, you know, I think that the oldest person in our company is like, 45 so it's a very very young team so we're often dealing with like a lot of school leavers and university leavers and and to be honest I think it's important to do a degree that you know is gonna is gonna you know is gonna arm you with as much skills as possible really it just comes down to you you know like your your work ethic your approach to work how good you are at working within a team um, how you apply yourself, how you challenge yourself, like these are all things that, 
you know, any employer is going to look for, like, regardless of the degree, you know, like one of the things that we ask when we interview people is how old were you when you had your first job? Uh, we want to know that people have, you know, been, you know, have learned how to work before they come to us. And that could be a Saturday job on a shop floor. It could be, you know, glass collecting, you get a, well, I guess these things are quite challenging in this current environment, but, you know, um, selling on Depop, for example, or eBay, like just someone who has built up a work ethic that is outside of the academic environment is something that we look at really closely because you can definitely tell the difference between someone who has worked before and someone who hasn't. Um, and they tend to hit the ground running a lot faster. But in terms of your actual degree, you know, it, you know, it's all these things that you're learning about or just building blocks to learn how to learn and become more accomplished. And I think unless you want to do law or medicine or architecture, something that just requires, you know, the, those actual qualifications, then really it's, it's going to come down to you, like your degree. If you have a history degree and an English degree, it's not going to stop you from getting the opportunity that you want to get. That's 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 really, you know, that's really going to come down to you and your, and your skill and your capability. And I think if you're going to do something for three years and, you know, particularly with English, which I did, it's a lot of independent learning. You know, you're not in a classroom like nine till four I think there's still school hours it was at 8 30 to 4 um, <laughs> you're not you're not you're not in a classroom um all day long you know you, you're kind of left to your own devices quite a lot so you definitely need to be motivated to want to study the thing that you want to study and I'm so glad that I did English because it's something that I just I just really enjoyed and I was very passionate about it and I just and for me in terms of what I was going to do in the future like I back myself not what what's written on a piece of paper um and we have lots of people that come to us who don't have degrees as well and they're not they're not at any advantage or disadvantage in how we look at them as an employer but maybe having gone to university they've been able to bring along a skill that school might not have um that school might not have given them so really it just comes down to you i wouldn't i wouldn't be too nervous about um choosing something that's super broad like then the, the opportunities that you've got more opportunities open to you if anything and so what did you do after university then, Emma? Um, <laughs> what did I do after university? Um, I didn't actually really plan it um, particularly well. Like uh, when I was at university, um, I had a part-time job. Um, working in Liverpool City Centre, actually, I worked um, on the shop floor for a company called Whistles. And um, when I graduated university, I just needed to... Um, earn money and pay rent so I just went and got a job in another shop and at some point I thought I'm going to start my career at some point like I'm going to go like do go for the big interview and do the big job etc but actually what I what I learned on the shop floor was basically my crash course in retail and I became um, I, I kind of worked my way up into the buying office of the company that I was working at which was really, really good fun. Like, you got to travel loads, um, meet with lots of different types of people all over the world. And um, and uh, I became obsessed with online because thinking back to my Saturdays on the shop floor, um, you get, you know, a bit of busy time in the morning, then lunchtime would be really quiet, and then you'd be, like, kind of busy towards the end of the day. And if you ever worked between Monday and Thursday, like, you know, they'd kind of be be like crickets like there'd be no one in the shop it'd be really really quiet and everything was geared towards um Saturday and Sunday trade and one of the things I loved about online was that you can reach any customer anywhere 24 7 and I just love that idea of being able to know everything about your customer from a data perspective as well it was very it was very fascinating to me that you could look at all the different types of behavior you know how people are communicating with you on social media um different sources of traffic um, understanding about customer frequency, how many times they come back to you. Um, like there, there are so many, if you're, if you're kind of interested in um, maths and statistics and data, e-commerce is a really, really fun um, industry to go into because there's just so much information out there to interrogate. So for me, um, eventually, it never felt like I was like, right, I'm going to go get this job now. Um, I just sort of rolled with it made the most of every opportunity that was in front of me and when it when it felt time to take the step to set up my own thing um i just i just went and did it really but i'd only been in the working world maybe like 
four years by that point. So it definitely felt like a big, uh, a big risk to leave my job to start a business. Parents weren't very happy. So how did you go about it then? Who did you do it with? Where did the idea come from? Yeah, so the idea came from, um, I was working on the buying team for an online retailer and we worked with like quite big brands like Burberry, um, Mulberry, um, like all the kind of ones that you might recognize. And we get all these like small brands just showing up at the office with like suitcases, like full of samples saying, oh, like, can you look at my stuff? Like, you know, I'd love to be stocked on your website. Um, and the reality is a retailer that, and the way that online marketing worked back then, it's quite different now, but back then, all your marketing was about building up an email list as quickly as possible and um, becoming visible um, in Google searches and also paid ads on Google. And for that, you needed brands that people recognized. So, you know, if you had stocked a brand like Mulberry and then a celebrity uh, wore, um, had a Mulberry handbag, then people would start Googling the celebrity and this is how you'd start to um, capture traffic for your website. And then you would offer discount codes to say, you know, get 20% off your next order by signing up to our mailing list. So then you build up this big email list and then your strategy would be to turn as many of those people on that email list into paying customers and hopefully they would they would come back um, very, very frequently. But if you were a small brand that no one had ever heard of, like that business model was just not set up for you because the retailers are trading off, you know, I guess the momentum and the buzz of a, of a, of a well-known brand. And, but a small brand that no one's ever heard of, it's like you can't do anything with it. You know, if you're a retailer that stocks famous designer brands, you know, you've got to invest disproportionately um into a brand that no one's heard of so all these brands were coming knocking on our door and it was like but their product is so good we can't do anything with them and who's going to give them a helping hand you know how are they going to get started you know fashion is an industry that is very traditionally um you know about who you know and who you're connected to and it's a very expensive industry to get into because even before you know, around the time we started Silk Fred, you know, your only routes to market were to have your own boutique, which is very expensive, or to get stocked at Selfridges or Net-A-Porter or one of these big known stores. And, you know, it, it was very, it's very expensive and difficult and time consuming to go those two directions. Um, so we thought, um, so my friend, the, the, so we, that was my experience at the retailer I was working with. And then my friend, who's now my business partner in Silk Fred, he had a friend who'd invested in a young um, fashion designer and it wasn't going very well. And they'd had um, a startup investment of about 20 grand and they'd built a website, they bought some stock, they'd hired a PR company to get them on all sorts of celebrities and influencers and uh, they weren't selling anything. So he asked me if I'd look at it. And then as we started to talk through it, like, oh, you know, I mean, you guys, you guys won't believe this, but they used to build websites in Flash which aren't even supported on mobile devices. And that was the change at the time that everyone was moving from desktop to mobile. It's kind of crazy thinking back that far that, you know, that, that was a big thing, like mobile is the next channel anyway. Um, so their website wasn't even functioning on the channel that all the customers were now going to. And it just felt like such a shame. It was like, oh my God, there's this person, you know, there's all these people with this great product and all this passion and, they either can't get it started themselves and the people who can help them won't help them because it doesn't make sense for their business model. So we decided sort of there and then um, that we go create a platform to take all of those brands to market. Um, so because the way that Silk Fred works is it works very much like a marketplace. So the brands sell through our platform and then we do lots of marketing and logistics and manufacturing support for those brands. So the kind of idea is that if you're someone with an idea for a fashion brand, you can come to Silk Fred and we're going to help you grow it into a meaningful business without, and we're going to, you know, we're going to hold your hand every step of the way. And there's, you know, there's one brand that, you know, when we first started working with them, um, they were selling maybe like, 600 pounds a month on a market stall um, in London. And it was just one founder on her own, really, you know, just really driven, really passionate. And, you know, this year, you know, she'll she'll do 20 million of revenue just on Silk Fred, not even her own business. 
and um she's got a team of like 30 people in a warehouse and it's you know i remember when like she'd be running down the post office with like loads of parcels um in the back of her car so um you know so it's it's been really rewarding i guess to be working alongside lots of entrepreneurs as we've sort of had our own journey and it's felt very fitting for the time because um you know probably about two years into the business everything started to change with how, how things were being marketed online and it started to become about is your product more interesting rather than the brand that it's from so it felt like we were really well positioned to be able to compete with more well-known brands and suddenly we started people say you know we started to say people started to say you know i find you guys much more exciting than asos you know like you're selling all these like niche brands that i wouldn't have discovered otherwise um and it was the down to a power of the power of a photo um and we were one of the first fashion companies online to really leverage video and video content and i think that's probably what we've become really well known for is our you know i mean the original idea that i had was that it'd be like harry potter you know like if you scroll down your facebook feed or your instagram feed it'd be like the the paintings or the pictures moving rather than it just being a static photo and um and it worked incredibly well and that became sort of foundational to our marketing strategy and also having worked in luxury fashion a big part of what we wanted to achieve with silk Fred was that we were a company that we that didn't take ourselves too seriously it was always about let's forget about what vogue cares about what do actual real women want and how can we talk to them in a way that um you know it engages them and doesn't talk down to them and doesn't patronize them so these kind of bringing together these communities, two communities of customers who are sort of bored of the high street and feel very left out by the big fashion magazines, but still want to feel good about themselves. And then all these brands that no one was really giving an opportunity to, it kind of felt like this was a good community to go about um, building. And um, we got started with, we had some seed investment. Um, we went and found some investors and I sort of pitched to them Dragon's Den style. Um, which was very scary. Um, and I remember like one of the worst questions that I got asked was, so you're 23, you've never run a business before. And I was like, no. And then they said, and you, no one's heard of you. And I'm like, no. They're like, and you're gonna sell brands that no one's heard of. And I was like, yeah. And no one's heard of your company either. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember when he asked that question, I was like, oh, my God, is this like a huge mistake that we're making? But it felt it felt like maybe we were slightly ahead of the curve. But everything that's kind of happened in the online space in the last four years and still happening is has been something that we've been really, really well positioned for. Like even during this situation, I hope you guys and your families are all safe. But, you know, Silk Fred started as a remote company. We all work from our houses for the first two years. So everyone's pretty comfortable working at home. Um, a lot of our customer experience team are mums at home. Um, so we've always been um, doing stuff remotely anyway. And um, because we have 800 brands that ship from 800 different warehouses, it never felt like a big risk to have just one warehouse. Um, so it's so, you know, it's I think we've been like really, really, I mean, I wouldn't wish for this to happen, but we've been pretty well positioned in our industry um, to stay to stay resilient, which is which is a blessing in itself. So what are the best things and worst things about your job then? Because obviously, you know, owning your own company must come with its own, with its own stress. Um, yeah, it's very stressful. Uh, there's definitely a lot of sleepless nights. Um, I think that anyone that I've spoken to, even people that have run companies like way, way bigger than Silk Fred, um, you know, they, they always wrestle with the, am I the right person to do this? Am I good enough? And you always think if I can get a little bit bigger and we can, you know, be featured in this magazine or we can get this number of followers on social media or this many customers or, or whatever, whatever the benchmark is, you always think that when you get there, then you'll finally feel confident and you know what you're doing. But then actually you get there and you still don't think you know what you're doing. And your biggest fear is that everyone's going to figure it out at some point. <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. Um, so I think I think that's one of the hardest things is, you know, you're constantly questioning yourself. And it never. But this is true, I think, of a lot of people who start businesses like it never feels good enough or finished. So I think I think if you, I think if um, I think I think uh, I think it lends itself well to let's call it a slightly more anxious style of personality, 
which is probably why we do it. Um, hardest thing, it's just about resilience. Like you've got to have so much mental resilience to do it. You know, people are going to look to you for answers that you might not have yourself. Um, like particularly with coronavirus, you know, like having to give the team reassurance that they're still going to have jobs. Like at the end of it, the reality is you can't give that clarity, but all you can offer is support and empathy and reassurance. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of mental resilience needed. And the best thing, just high highs that I just can't be rep, just just really difficult to replicate. Like um, Black Friday, um, which is the Friday after Thanksgiving, is like our biggest sales day of the year. And every year we throw up big screens around the office and we stay in the office until midnight and just sort of watch the numbers and see like, where's it going to get to this year? And being in those moments where you hit a new milestone and you've got your whole team around you, like, yeah, like just completely unbeatable. Um, it's a lot more boring than you might realize. Um, <laughs> you do get high highs, but there's so much work that you have to do that might not be the things that you're really passionate about. Like I'm really passionate about e-commerce, um, tinkering around with the front end of the website. You know, if we change the checkout, will this happen? Will that happen? Um, supporting the brands and the entrepreneurs that we work with and custom, you know, the customers, like all the stuff I really care about. Do I, do I care about being audited? No. Do I care about GDPR, new EU regulations coming in? Like, no. But these logistics, the warehouse, like that's just a whole thing that I find really, really challenging and not very enjoyable, but it's so important to the business. So I think I think people assume that you're gonna have a lot of creative freedom to, you know, just really do the things that you really want. But the reality is you're probably gonna end up doing the jobs that no one else wants to do forever. As long as you have your own company. And even more heartbreaking is what I've found throughout the lifetime of Silk Thread is letting go of the things that I really love doing because the team's grown and now there's someone else doing it and they're sort of like carrying the torch on. It's like, yeah, but that's my job. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's definitely a lot more boring than people realize. Um, there's a lot of like drudge work, but, you know, the good things are, are those, those moments where you're like, wow, like we did this. Can I ask, why the name Silk Fred? <laughs> it's such a good question. Um, I wish it was something a bit sexier than what the actual <laughs> story is. Um, the reality is we just needed a name and we needed something like quickly because we wanted to register the domain. And we were like Silk and like Thread, like T-H-R, um, E-A-D, like community. And then we were like, why not Fred? Like it just sounds like snappier. And the domain was free um and then we just bought it and then i think we always thought at some point we're going to change the name to something like like a proper name that actually means something <laughs> but actually it worked it worked really well in our favor because people who i started to talk to about it they were like oh i like it but i don't know why i like it but it's just it's just very memorable and you know there were you don't know which direction your business is going to go in um go from the beginning and i think what i see from like lots of people who want to set up their own businesses it's about oh if I can get the branding right or the name right or the website perfect or my business cards printed then I'll be ready to launch but the reality is you just kind of need to get going and some things um, that are really important at the beginning won't be important because ultimately your customers are going to dictate what happens to your business and how it gets shaped and refined and um, I'm not saying that it's not I'm not saying that you don't need to think these things through but you know it, Silk Fred was not something that we put tons and tons of thought into and it just took a life the name just took on a life of its own and it seemed to work like it just it just seemed it just seemed to be very people found it like you know that they remembered it um it was very different and if i think about like the names of like a lot of the online retailers like a lot of them don't make sense like boohoo like what does that mean you know like asos like i remember when asos was as seen on screen because what they used to do was um throw up photos of people on the red carpet and then they would like copy the outfit and it would literally be a photo of the celebrity in the outfit. And obviously now it's become something much, much bigger. But ASOS or ASOS, however you say it, like doesn't mean anything either. So really, you know, your 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 company is going to take on a life of its own and a personality of its own. And the name in itself, um, you know, it's not it's not ultimately going to matter too much. What matters, similar to what I was saying before with you, you know, with what you make of your degree, it's going to come down to like, 
what you make of the opportunity and it's about all the decisions relating to the execution that make a company not necessarily the name i was absolutely convinced it meant something so that is fascinating <laughs> yeah don't tell anyone that we didn't think that hard i thought there was sort of a hidden message in it or something um, yeah we sometimes get messages going who's fred and like there's no fred <laughs> Yes, yeah, you'll have to recruit a Fred. And <laughs> um, we've had some questions. So um, one of our students has asked, when you first started out, where did you source your clothes from initially? Yeah, so um, what we did was we went and hunted down um, some um, young designers and brands that we were really excited about. So we looked we looked at physical markets like Portobello Road Market, Brick Lane Market, Spitalfields. These are all like markets in London. Um, you guys have markets in Liverpool too. So we just sort of, we looked around there and just found brands that didn't really have an online presence and had products that we thought really interesting. We went to lots of student fairs. Um, we found lots of brands on social media and still like now, now it's a lot easier because they're just so visible. But if you're thinking of starting a fashion brand and you're just literally looking at sourcing product, um, there are um, places where you can go where you can buy imported products. There's a place in Manchester, I think it's Chetton Hill. Quote me on that. Um, but they, but you know, you can go and you can buy the stock and then you can style it how you want. And then if you build a relationship with them, then you can start to ask for like more bespoke things. So. You can go buy a black dress, put your label in it, photograph it according to sort of like your brand style. And then if you build up a relationship with this player, you can say, okay, you know, that black dress, can you make it like three inches longer and put spots on it or hearts on it or whatever you want? So, and I think also if you want to start your own fashion brand, like manufacturers are a lot more accommodating than they used to be. Like 10 years ago, if you wanted to make less than 10,000 of something, then no one would work with you. Whereas now manufacturers and suppliers are a lot more confident with, you know, making you like a hundred of something. Um, and if you buy it, as I've suggested, which is sort of like wholesale, like cash and carry, you know, you can buy like 10 units or 20 units of something. So you can, so you can start off like, you can start off sort of bit by bit, but we didn't source in that way because we weren't a brand. We were building a retailer. So we went and sourced brand specifically so we had to we had to go down a slightly different route and um, what advice would you give to anyone thinking of starting their own online business um similar to what i just said like just get going with it like don't overthink it um you know like some of the really really good marketing um blogs um i would definitely look at like neil patel uh, does a really good podcast called marketing school and i think I think anyone starting an online business, like just get going, you know, reach out to lots of people, ask them for their feedback. Do you like this? Become become like an expert in a couple of areas that are important to e-commerce. It doesn't mean that you have to be like an expert forever, but be good enough that you can um, hold the reins for at least a year or so. So, you know, learning about digital marketing is really important if you're starting your own e-commerce thing, because there's loads of agencies who'll tell you they can do the job and they can't like, marketing only really scales when it's in-house um, and if you're starting off on your own that's the number one thing that you can probably learn about and I'd say um, and I'd say and, and I'd say I'd say yeah just be just be just be very ready to get stuck into lots of different lots of different areas um, accounting things like that but yeah I, I would say don't overthink it just get going like as I said like so many businesses that you meet or people that you meet who want to start businesses like they're always waiting for like everything to be perfect before they go and you're better off just going and then refining as you go like I still don't think our website is perfect and we're like eight years in <laughs> so um so yeah I, I'd, 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 I'd say just get going and I'd say yeah like definitely definitely cultivate resilience mentors find mentors there were so many good people in the industry who've sort of come up through the ranks and honestly anyone I've ever reached out to no one's ever said no I'm not going to help you like everyone's like I'll you know I'll, I'll go for coffee with you for an hour or I'll take a phone call for half an hour and I'll give you it and I'll tell you everything that I know so I definitely you know I definitely look to build that network of mentors as well like that's been something that's really really been helpful for me just someone to pick up the phone to who's been through it before is uh, invaluable. 
we've got quite a spread of ages on here. So we've got okay. um, one of our school leavers um, who is actually just about to finish her degree remotely this week. Uh, and she, yeah, she said, is there any advice you would give to people graduating um, into the creative fashion industries in the current climate? Oh, that's a tough one, isn't it? Because I think, I think you know, um, I I graduated university in two thousand eight, um, which was the last time we had um, you know an economic crisis. And me and my peer group, when we graduated, you know, um, I didn't. I just went. And, I got a job in a shop, but my friends who were trying to get jobs in law firms and things like that, like it was it was it was really hard going. So having having graduated in a sort of similar-ish situation um, back in 2008, what I'd, what I'd advise you to do is think about, think about what differentiate, what, what differentiates you. Think about, you know, what, 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 what employers love to hear is what you can do for them. So like a lot of people go into interviews saying, so I'm a really good team player. Um, I'm really dynamic. Um, I, I'm really ambitious, blah, 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 blah. But really what you want to hear is, if I come into your business, then I am going to be able to add value here, here, and here. Um, so I think I think finding ways to differentiate yourself is really good in creative fashion in particular. Um, potentially, if the I don't know specifically what um, what part of it you're trying to get into, but if it's you know if it's anything to do with like content creation, like video production or graphic design, or even fashion design in itself. I'd be um, trying to build up as much of a portfolio as work to be able to show somebody to get them to listen. But I think graduating now, it would be I'd, be, I'd be just trying to build connections and reach out to lots of people. But I think, I think, yeah, it's probably it's probably going to be quite tough. But look, there are always opportunities for for people who want to work hard. Um, so I'd say I'd say keep a positive mindset. Think about what value you can add to an employer, and think about. Think about what you can, how you can stand out, like in the thing, in the skill that you're trying to get into. You know, the people that I saw um, who got hired um, when no one was really hiring in 2008, they took, they took the less sexy jobs. You know, they took, they took jobs that you know weren't necessarily in buying. They took jobs in, you know, slightly let's call it less exciting areas of business with the hope to prove themselves and get there so and, and that always worked really really well for them actually because typically when you do the jobs that you don't want to do you end up progressing the other people aren't necessarily that interested and you end up progressing faster and learning a skill that's going to be more cultivated it's going to be more sorry coveted later down the line and you end up getting paid more for it as well like a lot of the a lot of the people that i knew that really wanted to go in into buying went into merchandising instead because they thought it would be a sidestep but actually now because data is so important to e-commerce it's the merchandisers um that that you know have more opportunities like a good merchandiser now can get paid double what a buyer gets paid so it, I, th I think thinking a little bit maybe letting go of a, a, a specific path um, and being open-minded to opportunities if you're in the door of somewhere that you like or you can get your foot in the door then I think I think right now that's probably that's probably enough thank you that's really good advice and can I ask as well what do you look for in your employees then Emma um hard working um I think is is probably the the, the biggest thing we look for like typically the team at Silkford are pretty bright people but that work ethic is really important because we're a growing company and it's an environment that's always changing and it's very fast paced and we ask a lot of our people um so you have to be you have to be pretty hard working because that work ethic especially in a situation now where you know we're going to have to work twice as hard to not grow at all this year so that means everybody working late nights weekends saying no to those zoom calls with their mates like so you know it's about having that that mindset of i'm here for whatever you need um, it's really important to us. Um, I also think that people who are willing to be flexible around lots of different situations. So, um, for example, we had um, we had a couple of interns uh, one year, and they they actually had ma they actually had master's degrees. And I remember being in the photo studio, and they um, they were very upset about having to steam clothes. 
And I was really annoyed about this because like I spent the first two years of my career doing pretty much nothing other than steaming clothes. And I sometimes still will go down to the studio now and like help out if I've got like a free half hour because it allows me to catch up with the team in the photography studio. And I think, you know, if, if it's good enough for me to do, then it should definitely be good enough for you. So I think I think having that um, mentality of I'll get stuck in and do what's needed. And, you know, it's a big, big turn off when people come into a business, um, particularly when they they're just graduated and they're young and they're like, no, I want to work on strategy. And it's like, look, you've kind of got to start somewhere. One of the best relationships I ever built in my entire career was for my old boss. And I I learned how she liked her coffee. And she had quite specific um, uh, way of doing it. But the point was, was that I knew that if she had a really important meeting or a difficult day ahead of her, if I brought her her coffee exactly how she wanted it, that would just make her day that little bit smoother. Um, and, and, it, and, and these little gestures, they go, they go a really, really long way. Um, we also look for like loyalty as well, like and people who are you know, respectful of their team members. We've got a really strong culture at Silk Fred. It's a very sociable team. Um, and I think I think Netflix have a similar sort of policy, which is we don't tolerate clever jerks, which is, you know, you can be really clever and really smart. But if you're going to be a nightmare to work with, then then you're not going to you're not going to last. So, you know, I think people's attitude and, and um, the people's attitude towards their colleagues as well is is really, really important for us. Thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, no more questions are coming in. I'm wondering if we wrap it up now and if you and I hang on for the next couple of minutes just in case anyone does want to ask anything, Emma, does that sound okay to you? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, that was absolutely amazing and absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us. That's okay. Um, I hope it was 